as you continue growing. And you never really reach a point where you say, now I know everything in mental health. There are always new emerging things. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. And uh, I bring everybody, I, I hope everybody will take interest in, in mental health. <laughs> yes. <That's Yeah>. cool. <laughs> okay. So now that you've met everyone on the panel, I think we can jump right in to our discussion. So today we won't have a presentation as we tend to have in these webinars. Instead, we're gonna do a Q&A and have a discussion around the table with each panelist. Um, as the audience members, feel free to ask questions in the chat box or you can tweet with the hashtag uh, mental health 254 and tag Kenya Psychiatric Association. And as I'll see questions come up, I could ask them here as well. Also, any comments you'd like to put there for our conversation to keep running, feel free. So um, we'll start right up with Darlene. No students always go first, so I'm gonna start with you. Um, what can you define domestic violence as? What's your definition of domestic violence and what are the different types of domestic violence that we have? Um, thank you so much, Dr. Stacy, for that question. Um, we can define domestic abuse or domestic violence as a pattern of behavior that is used in a relationship to gain power or to gain control over another person in that particular relationship that could be an intimate partner, it could be a child, or depending on the dynamics of that relationship, just anyone in that relationship. And the abuse can be physical, it can be sexual, it can be emotional, it can be economic or financial, and it can also be psychological. Um, these actions can range from manipulation, physical hurting, um, humiliation, blaming, injuring, intimidation, all that. And I also want us to note that domestic violence can happen to anyone, regardless of their gender, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their age, religion, or even gender. And another thing to note is that domestic abuse can occur in a variety of relationships. I think as I, I, as I have already mentioned earlier, for example, partner versus partner, that is intimate partner violence, um, parent versus child, sibling versus sibling, or even relative versus relative. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. That was quite the extensive um, definition. I think you've mentioned uh, a few that we tend to forget, something like financial uh, violence is something we don't really address or recognize as violence. So I like that you brought that up. Um, so the I have for the group is for Dr. Makanyango, um, in your experience in the field, what is the prevalence of domestic violence in our, in our setup? And is one form more prevalent than the other? Of the list that Del has given us, do you find that intimate partner violence is more prevalent? Is child abuse more prevalent? Is sexual violence more prevalent? What have you come across in your time in the field? The prevalence of uh, uh, intimate partner violence or gender-based violence is, is, is quite high. Globally, you would say we have 30% or one in three women have been a victim of uh, violence. And um, in Kenya, and for men, it's about one in four, yeah? In Kenya, it's, it's a bit higher because when I was in uh, Kenyatta, we were doing studies or uh, projects in, in uh, Partnership Population Council. Uh, we noted that about 47, 41% of women, Kenyan women have been victims of violence one time. And the commonest form of violence, I would say, um, one of the commonest form of violence is emotional or psychological. Uh, and then there's also physical, and then there's also sexual, and then socioeconomic and neglect. And uh, when we talk about domestic violence, we are not just talking about women, we are also talking about men. While I was in Kenyatta, I found the majority of the victims were women, number one, followed by children, girl child, number two, followed by 
boy child and then men child, uh, uh, men, yeah? So while we were there, we also received men who are uh, actually affected by violence. Although I, I'm a believer that more men are affected by violence out there, but they're not coming forward. Um, so I would say, I believe uh, child violence, child abuse uh, is, is quite high, though we may not have exact details to know how many of the children are actually uh, being abused right now. But uh, in a certain study of which I did in uh, Nairobi, in, in partnership with Population Council, in two public schools in Nairobi, I'll not mention the schools, we found out of about 400 children, um, the girls, about uh, 51, let's say 59, 59% of the girls had experienced sexual violence and 41% of the boys had experienced uh, sexual violence. So you see, these were children. This was a study where we went to the school and started screening with permission from the school, permission from the parents. And then there were screening questions. And, and the, of the children who agreed, 96% of the children agreed to be screened. Uh, we found 59% girls uh, and 41% boys had experienced sexual violence. Now we are not talking about emotional. We are not talking about physical. So you find, uh, I believe violence is quite prevalent, uh, it, it's quite higher. This is just sexual violence, but it must be much higher than we expect. I can't remember the other questions, but. Uh... Uh, no, that was the question. I just asked you of, of the different types, which ones do you think are more prevalent? So you've answered quite well. Um, you've mentioned how you believe that um, the, the, the sexual violence or the domestic violence towards men to be high, it's just that we don't know the statistics because they don't come forward. So that segues into my next question. Um, what do you think are the precipitating and the perpetuating factors that lead to um, intimate partner violence? And do you find that the factors are similar for both when the men and the women are victims, or do you find that to be different factors that bring about one or the other? <laughs> One of the common factors is disparity or variance in terms of e economic ability. Uh, yeah. We have found uh, that has been one factor where somebody has a lot and the other person does not have. And then also the issues of uh, personality of an individual. There are people who carry with them uh, some inadequacy in their lives and there's a power a control aspect that they, they feel to exert themselves. Uh, they have to exert themselves and show they're always in control. They have to exert themselves and, and show they are on top of things. We have seen that in families where, uh, especially the, the, an individual and, and usually the man, sorry to say, I'm not picking on it, it, it there's an element of inadequacy. There's also an element of inferiority. Perhaps. Uh, unemployment, poverty, those are some of the factors or they're not earning as much as, or they perceive that the woman is in a better place than them. The woman is doing biashara, is earning money, then she comes there and you you are there, you know, so you have to keep reminding her uh, where she should be. So those are some, some of the disparities. Then uh, mental illness is also uh, common in some individuals. You know, you find there are people who have mood disorders, Drug and abuse, alcohol abuse is a common factor in domestic violence. In many cases, you find uh, when the person is drunk, it's like an excuse to go and start fighting your children, your wife and children. But when they are sober, they are angels, you know? So, so you know, it's strange. We have also seen women uh, being violent to men. Although the interesting way, I would say women tend to meet out, in my experience as a psychiatrist, to, to, to release more of psychological, emotional violence. You know, a woman can keep quiet on you or, or, or make a man really feel so depressed. You know, the minute you walk in that house, there's silence, no food on the table and no sex. And no, you know, by the end of it, you go a week, two weeks, you know, you know. <laughs> You know, the, the guy can be crazy and he really feels maybe he's being frustrated at work. He's not, 
trying his trying his best to 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 make some money and he's not being appreciated and uh, a lot of these men don't know who to say who to turn to i mean what to say or who to turn to or where to go for help some of them will go to their drinking friends or some will go to gashugwas only to find that gashugwa or girlfriend let's say is is worse of course she's now just waiting to milk you of the little that you have <laughs> so you end up doubly depressed but um women tend to seek help more that's our nature you'll go to talk to someone to a friend to church to a, a counselor while men will not have anywhere to go so we really want to encourage men to speak out um men also get sexually by uh, boys the boy child is sexually abused quite a lot physically and sexually abused and a lot is not being said and a lot of them are growing up with inner injuries and psychological trauma which is untreated um, i like how you brought out about how most more often than not the women will do the psychological uh, warfare aspect of it i think it's important to mention that isolation and withholding affection and, and all that emotional manipulation is also abused and it's just as detrimental to the you know the mental well-being of your partner if you're withholding your affection from them as a punishment so i think it's good for us to address that abuse comes in different forms and that can be one of them uh, my next question will be for tumbili um in your opinion tumbili what do you think stops men from seeking help when they are victims or from speaking up about being a victim of uh, domestic violence and do you have any personal experiences you'd want to share with us if, if so uh, is my mic on yes yes we can hear you but we can't see you why why you can't see me <laughs> your video must be off huh your video must be off the video is so on okay i don't know much about uh, zoom but uh, it's okay it's okay you can just you can just uh talk we can figure out the video yes there we go there you we go. can see me yes uh your first question was uh uh what about... do you think stops men from and speaking up when they are victims of sexual or domestic violence uh first of all uh, i think uh men men are considered uh they are not supposed to talk about any anything to do with anything that is considered weak you know like for example uh why should men report anything any any matter of sexual uh that is done to them especially at this age you know if it's maybe a kid or someone they are they can report and it can be considered as a case but for someone like me uh, to some point it might be considered as uh, they take it as a joke you know that's why most men don't report such cases then again the maybe the the aftermath of the reporting you know like for me for example i've reported mm -hmm. cases as such cases and first of all to the people that i report to they consider it as like they consider me as weak you know like i'm yeah. just weak like sasa wewe unaanzaje kutuambia vitu kama hizi hauna kesi hauna kesi ya kutuambia wewe unadhani hapa polisi ni mali kwa mchezo unaona like for us men you you find it like it's just hard to report such at opig we coffee you find when any sexual harassment then another thing is uh, i think the society thinks there is nothing like sexual harassment to men you see like yes. you can't just you can't just report or write anywhere that you are sexually harassed you see so most men mm -hmm. tend to like keep quiet with it because they overthink how will the society take the whole thing yeah you see because sometimes we see artists perform then uh, they are from the audience there are people who like try to reach out to their uh, 
to their to their like uh, their their feet, their their thighs, and uh, to the extreme, they are uh, okay. That area around there, you know, in between their legs, we see those videos trending. There are even ladies who reach out and hold their 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 balls. You see, and nothing happens. The society just enjoys the videos. But there's a case of maybe someone, an artist like uh, Timmy T, that who went down uh, musically just because he trended for the same thing. Like there was a video that came out of Timmy T that dancing with a lady, then his hand, Ikafunua, uh, the hand, the guy raised the, the lady who he was dancing with, the skirt, Ali dance, Ali Nwa skirt yake. You see? And everybody, including us men, went against our fellow man. You see? So it just shows most of the time, the better option is just to keep quiet with it. Like I was harassed. Let me keep quiet with it because the, the society won't take any action. But if the same happens to a lady, yo, especially if there is a proof of a video, it just means to Billy will have to go down. You see, I don't know do if you uh, feel, my point is, if, yes, if I'm putting my point clear. Yes, do you feel like the, the, the invalidation comes from both the men and the women, or does it come more so from your fellow men? When you come forward and say, I'm Tumbili and this happened to me, do you get any kind of understanding from men and women, or both sides are just like, no, it can't be that serious, nothing happened? you're being dramatic uh number one number one i can say uh, it comes from uh both sides from uh, men and women and mostly from our fellow men like for example uh if i go tell my fellow man that uh, yo i was performing or uh, something i was doing this and that then i was sexually harassed first of all they will laugh you know that actually they will tell me to, to, I should have taken it as an advantage, you know? So number one, it, it's, a, it, it's from our fellow men. We men, we fight our fellow men. We are our own uh, enemies, we men, uh, in matters mm -hmm. to do with sexual harassment. Cause for me, to me, I'm feeling like I was harassed, but if I tell my fellow man, he feels he takes it as a, uh, he takes it as an advantage, you see. The other thing is the society, in general, men and yeah. women. The society in general, men and women, uh, we we fight ourselves. It's a matter. It's yet to to come into like uh, to be something that can be discussed in seriousness and in much details that a man can be sexually harassed. And maybe uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the person in question, Menyame Kuharas, Achukuliwe Hatua. You know, sometimes it might be your fellow man, sometimes it might be your, uh, it might be a woman. And if Ikiwa Mwanaume, that's when it can be taken seriously because of maybe. Uh, cases to do with LGBTQ. You see, come on, Mwanu Mwenzangu, action will be taken faster compared if uh, it was a woman. You see. That, um, I think that's, you brought up an important point that um, as a society and community, we do have a perception of how a man should present and it's unfortunate that speaking up about sexual violence is considered weak well in reality it's a very brief thing to do it's a very brief thing to be that vulnerable and you know speak up and say this happened to me it wasn't right and i need someone to help me through it so i think yeah you're right as 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 a group as a community we do need to address that and and, and try and find a way to i don't know if it's to give men equal um I don't know what the word is, but there needs to be yeah, some but, sort of 
equality okay. when it comes to what is happening to both sides. The thing is, uh, mm -hmm. it will take us a long way, we, a long way uh, 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 to, to get to a point where men and women are treated equally, you know. I don't think we'll ever get there. I don't think we'll ever get there. Because uh, women, even verbal, like verbal, sometimes if you just like appreciate a woman, uh, maybe uh, appreciate maybe their beauty, maybe by de describing to them, some point it's taken as a sexual harassment, right? <laughs> Mm, I need yeah. you to say more. <laughs> yes, please yeah, say more. <laughs> I need you to expound on that point because that is a is, is you need to expound on that point so that we understand where you're going with it. Yeah, maybe some some point you sometimes you just tell maybe uh, a, a a lady uh, like I gonna ask for you you know like maybe there are those ones who take I don't know if that's. A sexual harassment maybe the way they take it you know there is a way they will take it and uh, to some point it might sound as an as, as an harassment you know yeah for example if someone tells you that maybe it depends maybe they are torn how many torn do wange na ileta kama 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 maybe ni matus yeah i think if we're being honest <laughs> and maybe Darlene can join me in this one. I think if we're being honest, sometimes we, and this is for both men and women, I think. I think sometimes we are not sensitive. How we say things, what the things we are saying are being going to be understood as, the context in which we're saying things. And I think that is when these things are shifted from being a compliment to being harassment. So if you use a certain kind of language in a certain kind of setting, it's very difficult for that to be perceived and to be received as a compliment when it has made someone uncomfortable. And I think it goes to the same thing you were talking about. You're on stage, you're performing, and this woman is yelling all these things at you. She's grabbing you. She's doing all those things. You see, that's a matter of time and place and the context of which this whole thing is being handled. So I think that's um, the gray area that comes in when you, when you say that sometimes people are just giving a compliment, but you have to consider, what am I saying? What is my intention with what I'm saying? And am I considering the effect that what I'm saying is going to have on the individual receiving it? Um, uh, to segue into uh, the next discussion, we've talked about the times men are victims and women and the different factors that come into play. I would like to talk about more often than not, the victims are blamed for the thing that has happened to them. So this is a question for Tumbili and Darlene. Why do you feel or why do we see that in most cases, the victim either takes all of the blame or is sharing the blame with the perpetrator for whatever assault, whatever um, yeah, violence has been attacked on them? Um, thank you very much, Dr. Stacy, for that particular question. I think one of the reasons why people um, put the blame on the survivor or put the blame, put, put equal blame on the survivor and the perpetrator is because in some instances you find that the, the perpetrator is perhaps a family member and because the family does not really want so much drama around that. So they just perhaps just force the the survivor to just keep quiet about it and not report the incident to anyone. Also, it could be because perhaps the family wouldn't want to pursue the justice system or they're not in a place where they can financially support um, the survivor to go through the justice system, which is very, very unfortunate in some instances. And also I think it's just how society puts it at times because you, you'll just find that most of the times when someone is perhaps, um, when something happens, the first question someone will ask is, what, was the circum what were the circumstances in that 
uh, in that particular setting let let me use an example for example you have a wife and a husband and someone let me use the wife is perhaps uh, physically abused by the husband someone will ask what did the wife do that triggered the husband to do that and there's just so much shame that surrounds um that surrounds the survivors and the victims of, of domestic abuse and domestic violence. And that pushes them to just keep quiet and not have the urge to go and report such instances, which is very, very unfortunate. And I think as a society, we need to uh, change, we need to change the way we respond to such instances so that our first instinct is to take care of the survivor or take care of the victim and just support them through their journey in the healing and support them through their journey in seeking justice. That way we can push other people to also try and report so that people can know their consequences for such actions, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting you mentioned that it's because sometimes the, the perpetrators are family members um, Dr. Makanyango, have you seen instances where family members actually try to hide or cover up the abuse that's happening, may it be with children or with a partner? Have you come across situations where you're there with a patient and you're there with, say, their mother and they know what's happening, but they're trying to tell you, okay, let's not make a big deal out of it. Let's just keep this quiet. Because I think personally, I've had that experience as an intern where I, I, I received a patient, she's a female patient, five year old. And it was very clear that some sexual assault had happened. And I remember the mother telling me the story and telling me a cousin, an older cousin, a teenage cousin was responsible for this. But then telling me to keep it hush, not to write anything on the discharge summary. In fact, she told me to write hepatitis as the diagnosis on my discharge summary because she felt that if I was to disclose what happened, there would be some dispute within the family. So is this something that you see happen more often than not? It's, it's so, so common, Daktari. Um, I know of families, I, I have followed some where uh, the wife is just totally helpless because her husband is having sex with the children. And, uh, you know, there's no nothing she cannot report it because she has nowhere to go completely. She depends on him. And uh, what she has opted to do is to take uh, her children now away to live with the grandmother far away. Do you see? So now the children and the younger girls are living with the grandmother, but she's stuck with this guy, you know, because she has nowhere to go. So, so that happens. Also threats and fear of being um, stigmatized, abandoned, rejected, or chased away from that community, that home. Many women, that has happened to many women where you reported, you, your, your spouse to the authorities and uh, the, the neighbors, they, they throw you out, you and your daughters, you, you go. So now they have absolutely nowhere to go. So it's, it's quite common and we need shelters, we need safe spaces where victims can go and stay and, and be supported and loved and economically empowered, psychologically empowered. Unfortunately, we don't have enough of that. We've had shelters, we've had I think a few organizations are doing something, but it's not very easy. So a lot of people just keep quiet, you know? Uh, yeah, I'm handling a few cases like that. Oh, wow. Okay. It's not easy. <laughs> yes, it's not. It, it makes the, the, the one who's supposed to help also very helpless because how do you help a family when the family doesn't want the help? It's very difficult. Um, but I think we have to have a pro... I, I suggest we have to have a program of targeting the perpetrator. You know, we are focusing on victim, victim, but that perpetrator, I think he needs help. Uh, if the woman has no alternative, no place to go, we have to find a way to approach the perpetrator, have individual sessions with him and help him find out what is the problem. We want to help you and that kind of thing. Maybe those are some of the areas in such helpless situations where we have to explore. That's my thought. I like mm. that because we know more often than not, the perpetrators are people struggling, like you said, mental illness, they have their own inadequacies that need to be addressed. So you, you, you have a good idea there that maybe we need to also shift the focus 
on trying to save the perpetrator from whatever is going on with them. Um, we've talked about children and we can segue into children being victims. And I think more often than not, children are victims either directly, either abuse from either a parent or a fellow sibling, or they witness the abuse happening in the home. Um, in your experience, what have you seen being the effect of the, the brain development, the personality development of these children who grew up in very abusive homes? What do you see becomes their fate into adulthood? Children get tra traumatized. Um, and a lot of the children blame themselves for some reason. You know, when something goes wrong, they say, is it me, you know? But uh, it has been found that such a trauma in the home it could be to, between the parents or, uh, or on the child. Uh, 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 it, they actually lead to uh, injury in the brain. There's some injury in the brain where a child is constantly being exposed to uh, trauma. It could be psychological. Of course, physical uh, abuse will give direct injuries uh, to the child, but the psychological uh, or trauma, the impact of the psychological trauma is worse because it's long-term. And the child is likely to really internalize that, blame themselves and develop inner, inner forms of anxiety, fear, uncertainty, and attachment issues, you know? The child now doesn't wanna go to school because she fears that if she goes to school, then uh, mom will be beaten. So, so there, there, there's issues of school refusal, issues of clinging to parents because the housemaid, you know, other forms. Are, so, so the children develop behavioral problems, emotional problems, psychological problems. They're not able to focus in school. A lot of the time the, child, the teachers in schools are the first people to notice something is wrong with the child. And, uh, you know, normally I think some of the schools, the teachers are not that sensitive, unfortunately, and end up punishing these children by uh, a child who's not performing, who's not focusing, not concentrating, is punished because they didn't finish their homework. But the child is undergoing something really, really bad. So I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, in part to targeting parents, targeting school teachers and, and, and children so that children can seek help. So that a child when he's in suffering can actually dial a number and be able to, to get help. And um, screening of children, like the study we did in Nairobi in uh, April, 2017, it, it, that needs to be, um, I feel upscaled so that routine screening of children is done in, in all schools because it was quite uh, effective. Uh, and the, Im the, the intervention we did from that screening, because uh, we introduced psychotherapy, play therapy, and the children were able to open up. We also targeted the parents and gave them counseling. It, it was a, a good way to actually access uh, uh, help for the children. So I think that's that's something most people don't realize that there's uh, the organic brain disease that comes about from uh, the children being traumatized year after year after year, the brain actually changes. And that's something that has an effect long-term. Um, something that might be a little bit of a gray area for us in our community, um, spare the rod and spoil the child. Where does the line come in? Where do we draw the line between disciplining a child and child abuse, because that's something that we have all grown up with, a little bit of discipline here and there, but more often than not, it can cross over into something. So how do we identify where the line is and how do we raise children, especially the teen years, so that you're not too lenient, but then you're also not abusing your child? Yeah, we must discipline children in schools or institutions where discipline was withdrawn. And I understand there's some, uh, schools in Britain at one time uh, that uh, they, the ch teachers and the parents really had a problem because teachers were not allowed to discipline the children. And the children now were so rude and they overwhelmed everybody and nobody wanted them. So yes, you need to in institute discipline, but uh, the way you do the discipline must be in a, in a way that one, it's not gonna harm the child, okay? but it will communicate a message to the child that what you are doing is wrong, yeah? 
And uh, it, it should not be the first line of action. Normally you try to talk to the child, to explain to the child, this is wrong. You know, there's a process eh? and you have to communicate with the child. And then uh, the other thing, the child needs to know, by the time you're raising the rod to cane the child, you have to say, do you know why I'm caning you? It's because you did this and this, and that was wrong. And uh, how, many how many canes should I give you? Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, so that the child appreciates, but it also should be balanced with love and rewards when the child does well, when the child is, is, is otherwise okay, you communicate with the child, you love the child, you, you, you relate to the child in a positive way. So the child knows uh, that when they have done wrong, they had really have done wrong and that they deserve that discipline. But uh, again, discipline is not always using canes and rods. Sometimes you just decide to, to withdraw a certain privilege from a child. You know, if you, you allowed the child to play PlayStation uh, from four to five in the evening. Now you say no PlayStation for one week, <laughs> you know? Uh, if, if that doesn't work, you go to another way. But, but it, it depends on the child and it depends on the parents. But uh, the bottom line is they need to know that you're doing it because you love them and it's for their benefit. And you need to also be able to demonstrate love at other times and rewards at other times when the child behaves well. Uh, Delino, what's your take on that? Spare the rod, spoil the child. How do you view that as uh, one of the younger ones in the space today? Um, I actually think that that is a very sensitive topic, especially in an African setting. But I, I agree that punishments need to be executed from a point of love and it needs to be focused on not entirely inflicting pain on a child, but making them understand that what you have done is wrong mm. and not necessarily having the, you know, just wanting to inflict pain. Because when you just want to inflict pain on the child, you can actually go overboard with it. And you can end up um, harming the child's physical and mental health. And actually, when you when you harm the child's physical and mental health, you've actually now, I think that is where you now, uh, we need to draw the line there. But I, I totally agree that we need, to, we need to handle children in a way that just shows love and in a way that they feel, they feel that they're being corrected from a point of love and not just being punished for, you know, just, something that they probably did and something that was wrong, but the punishment has just gone overboard. So I think, um, I, I don't know, I'm not very sure on the physical punishment, but I also think that we need to embrace other forms of punishing children, including the withdrawal of different privileges. Yeah, thank you. Um, Tumbili, as a father for a hobby, how do you discipline your children? <laughs> What's your take on spare the rod, spoil the child? Uh, first of all, uh, personally, I don't, uh, I don't encourage uh, the beating or the weeping of kids. Because <laughs> uh, sometimes, like uh, personal, you see me, I grew up uh, like being beaten, but to some point you grow up you you are growing like you get beaten like maybe thrice a week to a point that you develop some resistance like right now you just want to do things because you know you will be beaten and you are used to it like you get used to caning you know so to me uh caning i grew up not knowing uh not understanding that you can correct a kid by by caning them because we, we were being caned like every time, if not in school, at home, or maybe on the way, just some random uh, stranger will beat you to some point, like you are now developing some resistance. So uh, <clears throat> me, most of the time you see my kids, are uh, 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 first of all, I had to talk to their moms. Uh, you see, they she can't beat them, you know, uh, for the period that we were still uh, living together. Uh, because you see, she was beating them like 
she's like sending some some signals to me like she's communicating to me by beating the kids you see so personally me i don't beat my kids that's uh, i don't know if it's wrong or right me i've never beaten my kids they are grown i have a six-year-old boy i have a five-year-old uh, girl i have a two-year-old girl you know so i don't beat them but uh, i have to punish them as a parent they have to know that this is wrong you know Number one, I have different uh, ways of punishing them. Number one, there is uh, like, she, uh, I have to send him or her behind the curtain. Like maybe she met, uh, he or she messed up while watching something. I have to cut short him or her watching whatever they were watching and they go uh, behind the curtain for like maybe 30 minutes or an hour. You know, that loneliness, like you create that loneliness to him or her. It goes behind the curtain. Like they fear that much, you know. The other thing is uh, sometimes you might, you, you can tell them to go uh, to the pantry. You, you see the, the, the pantry is like that small room, that small dark room, you know. So whenever you tell them, if you do this again, you'll go to the pantry. They won't do, they won't like mess again, you know. The other thing is like uh, just to, to stand and close their eyes. They will hear everything that is happening, but they can't open their eyes. Like, it's, I don't know if it's some kind of, should I call it torture or something, but they, 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 they get to learn. They get to learn. I... Like, most of the time, they can't do, they can't repeat the same mistake again when you do that to them. Another yeah. thing is they have to like, uh, the other thing is they kneel down and they, what are you looking <laughs> This is one of the culprits here. This is one of the culprits. <laughs> then the notorious like, one is this one. Yes, I think I think what, I like what all three of us have said. I think the, the general is find other ways to communicate the consequences uh, other than the physical abuse. It's important for them to have an understanding. Um, just a reminder, everyone, please ask questions in the chat box so that we can discuss uh, or leave any comments. Uh, I have one question here from Lynette Mukai. It's James, how do you deal with a case of child neglect which leads to defilement of a six-year-old by a known person? I think Dr. Makanyengo might be best uh, to answer this. How do you deal with a case of child neglect, um, which leads to defilement in a six-year-old or by a known person? Um, first and foremost, um, that child, it's an emergency. You need to find a way to report that case. I don't know how close you are to that child or to that family, but uh, if you're close to them, then you can find a way to have that child re removed from that environment and taken to a safe place, yeah? Uh, if you're not able to do that, report to the children's department. I, when I used to work in Kenyatta, I, used to, I would get some occasional reports of a case maybe in Kalolenia where, where a child is being abused. And uh, what we would do, we would call the children's department and they would actually go uh, to the place that this particular child, they went, they collected the child, they brought the child to the hospital. Okay, we had to look for a place to keep the baby while we had to talk to the relatives, find out, do counseling. Eventually, of course, we released the child and, and had a follow-up program. So yeah, something has to be done. And, and we also have the child line. They're the hotlines that you can actually call like the 1195, there's a child line helpline 116. There's a child line 1196. When you call these numbers, have these numbers. When you call, uh, you can actually report these cases and they can link with the police and, and, and go and rescue uh, this person or this child. Okay. Um, a follow up question is why is it that victims of abuse tend to be victims again and again? And women are known to stay and pray in abusive marriages. When should one leave? Dr. Makanyango, when do you feel like one <laughs> should leave? 
it, it, it's sometimes very hard. I have also seen that people who have been abused, I've seen people come from abusive relationship, they go to another relationship which is even more abusive and more abusive. It's like you, you have now turned, learned uh, to, that learning uh, to be a victim, then and some kind of learning that. process which is not, not normal, it's not healthy. And uh, there's just that tendency uh, to be drawn. And that's something normally when we see them, we highlight that and we have to dig down in their history, their family, how was their the history, were they traumatized as children? Uh, how, were they assisted as children? Because you find if there's, um, there's a gap in terms of they didn't get the therapy, the intervention they had in ch as children when they were abused, then, then you find uh, it's like it's something repetitive kind of uh, behavior. They seek uh, the same relationship uh, and, and we have seen that and sometimes yeah. it's difficult to explain um, but we have seen that quite a bit now a child who's been sexually abused uh, or, 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 or touched inappropriately uh, during the therapy we would see sometimes they, they they start touching they start doing the same they start reaching out to touch uh, others in the same way or they want to now younger, older children want to now have more sex. I, I've had children, uh, people who are rescued from another country, they were brought here and they were put in, a, in some rooms for, for so many days being raped. When they came back now, they, 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 they wanted men. They were saying, we, we want men, uh, I want a man. And you know, we admitted them, we, 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 we took care of them, we treated them. We are trying to have them go back to their country, but we were worried now they were not going to, <laughs> they wanted to, to now have that uh, sexual uh, abuse being done on them again and again, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a bizarre coping mechanism, you know, mm -hmm. in a situation where um, you are suffering, you're being abused, but that abuse is now turning around to be, uh, something you're looking for, you're seeking. It, it, it's, um, it's really pathological in a way because they keep getting injured and there's self-injury. They come with self-injury behavior, cutting their wrists quite frequently and uh, suicidal uh, ideas. It is pathological. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the reality that the brain likes familiarity. So what it knows, it will go back to and look yeah. for, unfortunately, yeah. Um, so we have another question from Ms. Njau on Twitter, and it says, what are the patterns of abuse and what are some of the early warning signs of an abuser, if there are any? This is addressed to who? This can be for you, for Tundili, anyone who has the answer. What are okay. the, some of the early warning signs of an abuser? An abuser or somebody who's abused? Um, an abuser, an abuser. What are the warning signs of someone who will be an abuser? Or is about, or I don't know how to phrase it, just an abuser. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they say that people who are abusers are people who have also had very unstable upbringing in their families. One, they have been victims of abuse themselves and, and basically dysfunctional families or you might find um, separation, you find sing single mother families. We have had, I've had cases I've followed where you find the man is, is, is a terror to the wife, but uh, she had been warned that this one uh, don't marry because you know, they had a single mother who uh, was not able to provide all that she needed, you know, the father figure, the mother figure. Um, so, from the background, it should give you an idea and also the upbringing and also the personality. Somebody you, sometimes you may not tell because there are some people who yeah. look so, so nice and um, perhaps they got married too quickly. They didn't have time to really learn them more. But I always urge the young people, learn about the family, go back, find about their family, visit their parents and see what kind of parents are they? What kind of uh, siblings? And how do they relate with each other? How do they respect each other? Because if they are not relating with each other uh, or respecting each other, uh, respecting their parents, then you know that is a red flag. It's a big red flag. If they are drinking a lot, drinking alcohol, abusing drugs, that's another red flag. 
if you get to know them exhibiting those kind of personalities before you marry, don't just ignore it and say, oh, when I get married, it's going to change. That's also another red flag. Get time to know them and their family history and their families. And I think at the end of the day, it's always very clear when you as an individual are uncomfortable, you will have that instinct, that gut feeling when I didn't like how I felt after we had that conversation. I didn't like how I felt after they did that to me or they said that to me. So I think also another warning sign is if you're questioning it, if you're already questioning if things are okay or not okay, then things are not okay. That's also another one. Um, in the case of intimate partner violence, what evidence can one produce in legal systems and yet you are only the two of you. Dr. Makanyango, in yes. situations like that, how does one, how do I ask Stacey go and say, hi, I'm Stacey, my partner has done this. How do I produce evidence when it's just me and that person? With physical violence, uh, you may have injuries and wounds, uh, the same as sexual violence, where you have to rush to the hospital where they can do a swab and isolate semen and, and you know, and, and infection or whatever. So medical evidence requires that you go immediately. Uh, when it comes to emotional abuse, and uh, that can still be, um, that one you'll have to go for assessment by a mental health team, because uh, they're gonna take the history and they're going to be able most probably to diagnose either an acute stress disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder and do a report. But ultimately we want to look at all those reports, report from the psych mental health team, from the medical, uh, the clinician team, from the relatives who used to hear that Unapigwa, you are screaming, all that comes mm. into one report. Yeah, <laughs> so that when you go to court now, it is <laughs> the evidence is there, then witnesses if there are any. But yeah. many times there are no witnesses. So, you know, it's so difficult sometimes. Somebody will say, uh-huh. Um, but I see Linda is saying something. Uh, yes, I can on the um, She's pointing out uh, on early signs of an abuser, something else is plenty of narcissistic traits are, are, are usually visible in how this person treats other people. Uh, they always want to be in control of things and the way you are behaving around them and they want to have their way. They will probably be those people who punch walls and break things around them, can't handle their own emotions. Uh, I think most often than not, abusers will be a completely different person to other people and then to the victim, they're very different at the beginning. So they're very kind to them, but they're mean to the wait staff. They're mean to any service industry provider they find. So that's also a warning sign because it's only a matter of time before that aggression is now turned towards you. That's what Dr. Nyamuta was adding to that conversation. Um, an anonymous attendee really? has asked, are there safe spaces for victims? Are there safe houses where victims can go and seek asylum and they're being abused by family members? You had, you had mentioned that in passing, but are there actual places we have that people can go. Uh, even for us as healthcare practitioners, when a victim comes to you and says, my name is so-and-so, I was raped by my auntie, my cousin, my uncle, where can we send them to help them? Because the hospitals are not the space for that. So what are the spaces where we can send these victims for help? Yeah, we used to have a problem in the gender-based violence center in uh, Kenyatta because uh, we would look for safe places. There were not many, uh, or, or they were there, but there were not so many. They were inadequate. But uh, we do have, I think if you liars with some of the civil society team like Koval, Credo, FIDA, some of the partners we used to work with, they actually knew where um, uh, some of these safe places are. They don't want to mention them because these are secret places because That's we have true. some perpetrators are stalking. They just want to, to, to kill, <laughs> they're, they're stalking you. And, you know, so there are places, but you need to go through uh, the team, the partners who are involved in the medical legal management of mm -hmm. uh, such cases. Yeah. And then uh, relatives, sometimes uh, if you have a relative, uh, you know, that can be a safe place, but it can also be tricky. Very so, tricky. 
it can be tricky actually. One time we had a, a sensitive one that where the perpetrator was a police, senior policeman who was literally looking to, 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 to finish his wife and the civil society had come in a group then they all came to my office and they're like, now what do we do? The best thing we want to approach this case as a group so that we are not gonna be pinpointed by this police, this senior policeman. And I don't know how the story ended, but I could see the anxiety that uh, the team had in handling such a case. I hope the survivor survived, the victim survived. Um, okay, I have a question from unknown but known on Twitter for really. What gave you the strength to come out and address what was going on in your life at the moment when you did? Thank you for always encouraging us. Please share with us your perspective and your story. <clears throat> uh, what? Like what, what gave me the courage to come out and speak? Yeah, to publicly speak out of what was happening in your life at the time. Yeah. First of all, I felt like, uh, uh, I felt like so many guys who are going through the same. Actually, it's not that I felt. <laughs> in my circle, uh, which is uh, has some celebrities, it's funny that, mm -hmm. uh, it, not that funny, it's, uh, it's surprising that so many celebrities who are married or who have been uh, in relationship, uh, some of them are going through this and uh, they are yet to come out and speak. Yeah, I don't know if you are, hearing me fine because uh, uh it's okay i can hear you yeah we can hear you yeah i can see some uh, i can see i hear some vibration from the nini um i'm, I'm driving to to town now i had a job <laughs> no from, problem no problem yeah so uh what first of all i was not to to talk because uh, uh the moment i was speaking that was like uh, the third is uh, the, the, the like uh, maybe the fifth or sixth incidents that uh, was already happening. I had encountered others, I had gone through others. And uh, at this time I felt like uh, there's something, my kids were being disturbed like mentally. Uh, they knew what was happening because you, you see these kids of nowadays, they are so sharp. My daughter at the age of two, she was already aware of what, what was happening. And actually uh, I was, they are the ones who are tying me to all these things like, I didn't want to leave them, you know. There's a time I left. Uh, I used to sleep in my car, pale outside the nation center. The security guys there knew. Uh, whenever they saw my car parked right there, they knew I was already sleeping. I was out out, out there sleeping, you know. So uh, I felt like my kids were being mentally tortured because uh, they could share this with their teachers sometimes uh, with their friends, and even uh, maybe sometimes the neighbors. Uh, the neighbors when maybe the kids uh, kind of, okay, maybe the, the, the areas we live in, the neighbors are not that harsh maybe. But uh, to some point, uh, they even, they were even fear, they, 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 they even feared playing with other kids because the other kids maybe knew what was happening in their house. So it got to a point where I had to, to come out with all the courage and the, and the face any anything that will, that will come on the way like uh, the, the bashment you know people laughing at me like up to this point even after reporting after talking about it people still come out and tell me oh you, you see but I'm very happy that I came out and talked about it so that the society knows that uh, in reality, this thing happens. That's, I just wanted to communicate that this thing happens. Men are being uh, beaten out there. Men are going through something and uh, it's not that they are weak. Because for me, uh, first of all, I respect women so much. Uh, I respect women because you know, I have daughters and uh, me having daughters is not the reason why I respect women. It's just in me, I was raised by my mother, you know. So I felt like, uh, let me speak out and see how people will receive this. Uh, and uh, it happened that uh, it was received in different uh, angles. There are people who saw me weak. There are people who felt like, uh, actually there are people who saw it as a cloud, I was cloud chasing, you know. At the end of the day, we, we handled everything. 
even though up to now there are still people who still uh, come out and uh, insult me with, with how I'm being beaten, uh, how I was beaten with a woman, you know. But uh, it was the only option because uh, me coming out to speak also scared her away, you know, because we had tried to sort our, our, our personal problems with no, uh, the, the only way was to, 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 someone had to come out, uh, someone had to go, you know? Yeah. Uh, for the sake of the kids. And for I think that's important, what you said. For the sake of uh, uh, both of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that you had to speak you see, out. me, I'm not a person. Yeah, me, I'm not a violent person, but uh, again, uh, me being a person in the, in the, in the public, uh, doing shows, you know, being, uh, the allegations were, were there, allegations, cheating allegations. Me, uh, like right now, I'm in, a, I'm in a Zoom call with three women. Right now, it would have been a problem, you see. Like you are having sugar mummies, you know. So it was it a was problem. It was a problem. Like right now, I wouldn't be having such a call, such a, such a, like a meeting, you know. So uh, I, I just had to free myself actually with options of uh, either her going with the kids, me leaving at the house for her. Uh, I just wanted to be free. I just wanted to have that freedom, my kids to be, to be, to be, al to stay alive, me to stay alive, her to be alive, you know, let everybody have their peace. Yeah. So me speaking out uh, freed me for, from so many stuff and even maybe my kids and maybe, and every other person out there who, who was feeling like, I know I started uh, with the speaking and uh, so many guys up to now, they are still feeling like, should I speak out or not? Because first of all, reporting to the station, police station is a problem. Because I remember uh, for this last incident that happened, I went and reported to the police station and uh, actually the first response uh, from a police officer, uh, I just knew this case was going nowhere because uh, it was like, it was like, uh, ni nani amepiga mwingine, ni wewe ama ni mbibi amekuchapa. Na wambia ni bibi amenichapa. Okay, na kuuliza katia wewe na bibi, nani amepiga mwingine. You see those, like I was, the guy was trying to make me feel so low that how can you be beaten with a woman? You see? Yeah. And it was not the first time I was reporting. Me, I have, like all my OBs in my life, Zotenza Kunini, of, of Nini, of uh, GBV. Izo Nini, the violence from my, from, my, from my wife, you know. And it was even extending to my kids. They were be, be, yeah. being beaten for doing nothing just because we have some differences with their mother. And that's yeah. when I just decided, I didn't, I didn't want to take it public. It's actually my friend Obina who took it public. But again, I saw it as a cause, you know, it was something I don't know how to, to say, but at the end of the day, uh, it's something that is happening. And maybe there's a man out, out there. Uh, for, for, for women, for women, they will always report. For women, they will always report. And me, me going to report always to the police, it was uh, for the sake of my, my, my security. Because she's a person where you can, she can beat you and uh, maybe put some marks on herself and run to the station to report. And me being a public figure, it, will, it, it would have been a, a big, big story where Tumbili has beaten his wife, you know. By now, I don't know where Ninge Kuawapi, I don't know. Because the society tends to listen, to give more ears to women than men. If a woman just reports to a to, to a police or reports that they have been they have been insulted or been beaten by by a man especially someone who is in the public domain like me i don't know i don't know like by now yeah. my case just ended like that yeah it just ended yeah. like that nothing happened i didn't mm. want anything to happen to her i just wanted to report and let the yeah. police have the case around their table yeah. just in case of anything you know I think, and that's a good, that's a good, uh, I think that's a good takeaway for anyone who is a victim or knows of any victims. The victim speaking up shows strength and more often than not, a perpetrator is 
viewing their victim as weak. So the moment they show the strength by speaking up, by seeking help, that shifts the power dynamic and is, gives them the opportunity to seek some help. Um, there's a question from anonymous attendee for Dr. Makanyango. How do you manage a child who is overseeking potential and is loud without making them feel unwanted, especially when they relate with other kids who are silent and reserved? Sorry, the, the child is seeking attention and is loud. And is loud. At an over seeking of attention and is loud. And how do you deal with that without making them feel unwanted? Especially, so I'm assuming that they make other children who are more reserved and quiet to feel bullied or threatened. How do you deal with that? How do you do the child? Normally there's, a, normally, there's an underlying reason for this excessively loud attention seeking yes. behavior. Uh, maybe the child feels that's the way to, to, to gain attention. You have to look at the history. Uh, how were they born? Uh, what were the dynamics in the family? And find out whether there was some kind of e e neglect uh, to this child, you know? And then mm. see where they lacked love, where they lacked attention. And, uh, and, and that needs to be addressed so that the, the child can be given attention, but you have to be very careful not to favor this child because the other children will also start developing similar behavior so that they can also gain attention. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would look at that child more and the family and the parenting. I think something went wrong somewhere, but again, children are different. You know, they are, I look at my own children. It's one of my daughter was hyperactive and she, she was very outgoing and she was, you know, as compared to my son. So again, there are those differences that normally uh, you find as the child grows in a, in a normal environment that also stabilizes and, and they tend to fit in to normalize like other children. So it just depends. This case has to be evaluated individually, specifically uh, to see whether it is within the normal or whether it is within the abnormal uh, uh, in terms of uh, spectrum behavior, yeah? Before you can make a, a, a decision or a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think the answer is look into what is going on with your child first before you're so quick to jump in to how you want to discipline them for how they are behaving. Um, we have a yes. comment. The conversation around single mother raised families. I suppose most of the men raised by women are more empathetic and sensitive. Where did the story of such being abusers hail from? Divorce is obviously an adverse childhood event. Hmm. Not sure if they're saying the sensitive ones are abusers or I suppose most of the men raised by women are more empathetic and sensitive. Where did the story of such being abusers hail from? Divorce is obviously an adverse childhood event. I think such cases where the single mother felt so helpless, there was no father figure. She, she, she had to raise this boy in an environment through difficulties and without any, any father figure. So as a result, something I, I found in a number of uh, people, uh, children I've been following or young people, that this is like a gap. So, so normally there's a lot of insecurity, struggling economic problems in the mother. And then uh, she probably is, has to move from place to place, uh, you know, with this child maybe get an, another husband who will take them and dump them again and that kind of thing. That happens around here quite a lot. And in the end, the children, I find, especially the boy child gets so, so traumatized. So he lacks a, a proper direction or, or, or model, you know? And uh, I've, I've seen those boys suffer. I've actually seen those boys suffer. So as much as possible, the mothers Ooh. need to, to identify a, a brother or an uncle or someone uh, who can bond with this boy and, and give that father figure kind of uh, uh, modeling. Uh, that's my, my, my thinking. Um, we can segue into a question by Lynette Mokaya that I think uh, can come from that. Delin, you can also give me your opinion on this. What's the role of culture in sexual gender-based violence, which leads to mental health issues? Do you think our culture has 
plays a role in the sexual gender-based violence and how does that lead to mental health issues? Um, I think actually culture plays an important role in sexual and gender-based violence and maybe by, by um, maybe by perhaps propagating it or having a culture where we just blame victims for where we just blame victims for for having experienced what they have gone through. For example, in some cultures, only females are responsible. Um, only females are blamed, sorry, only females are blamed when they have gone through uh, sexual gender-based violence, which is such a detrimental, which is such a detrimental culture. And in some, in some instances also, um, the perpetrators are not punished, um, they're just allowed to, you know, just coexist with the society. Or in yeah. some cases, for example, if you're perhaps harassed by your uncle or by someone just around the community, you're just expected to get married to that person. So yeah. that is very, very detrimental. But also in, in a way, culture is not all that bad. Culture can also help us. A culture can also be a way that helps us to combat such issues. Um, yes, we need to come to a place where we identify this is wrong and we shouldn't go on with such beliefs, but we also need, but we also need to identify aspects of our culture that allow us not to propagate SGBV. And having that conversation will be very, very necessary. Thank you. So I'm saying we are quite uh, into the night. Um, so I think we've, we've, we've come up with a lot today. We've had a lot today from the different panelists. I think everyone I'm sure has taken a takeaway from it. I think for me, what I've liked is that we've shed light on certain aspects of abuse that we don't often talk about. We've talked about the emotional abuse. We've talked about financial abuse, which can be the person who has more money in the, in, the, in the partnership or in the family withholding money from others as a, as a play on power. So we've discussed that. And if we're being honest, we can't solve the crisis in this one hour discussion. But I think the idea is that the more we talk about these things, the more people are able to openly talk about them, the more we create spaces for the victims to seek help, the more we make it more difficult for the perpetrators to continue with this acts of violence towards their loved ones and even to strangers. So I think this has been a nice start to the discussion. It doesn't have to end here. So if you have any more questions, unfortunately, we can't answer all the questions. So if you haven't had your question answered here on the Zoom, uh, please uh, continue on the Twitter space. Uh, put your questions there, your comments. We'll continue answering what we can throughout the week. And we'll be back here next week on Wednesday, same time. So the conversation will still continue. Don't worry about it. Um, I don't know if anyone has any parting shots. If they don't, I think I can call it a night because it's pretty late. Does anyone have any burning parting shots they'd like to share with the audience? Okay. Dr. Nyamute, uh, any, any parting shot you have for us as the host of this conversation? Um, none, just to say thank you to our panelists and uh, our moderator, of course, our participants as well, have been quite engaging. The questions have been streaming in fast and quick. I don't even think we were able to finish the questions we had planned to discuss. Um, however, next week, same time, same place, we'll be discussing social media violence and workplace violence. So join us, uh, keep the conversation going. As she said, Twitter will respond to as many questions as we can. Uh, the handle is at KPA uh, You'll find us there. So yes, maybe our panelists have one last statement to say maybe to our participants. Oh. Sorry, my <laughs> oh, 
Okay, my video is misbehaving at this time. No, you can okay. hear me. Okay. Yes, you can yeah, hear me. Yeah, just hear I think let's just uh, take care of our mental health and take care of our families and our children. I think all these things starts in the family, you know, from the time the baby's in the womb and uh, you, you you have a family, it, 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 all this can, uh, from there you find the foundation uh, to prevent such things um, is formed, yeah? So we have to have a loving foundation, a supportive foundation, a foundation where we feel appreciated and loved and communicate well. And this will go towards preventing uh, SGBV. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanyango. Uh, Berlin, do you have a particular question for us? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Stacy. Um, I think I just want to say thank you for having me here on this space today. This is a very important conversation that we need to keep talking about so that we we can all break the cycle of abuse. So as as we leave this discussion and in our interactions with our children, with our partners, and with that, with just the people around us, let's aim to end the cycle of abuse. Thank you and have a good night. All right. Thank uh, you so much. Great. I see someone in the comments talking about uh, in the LGBTQ community. We'll have a week when we're discussing uh, uh, violence uh, among vulnerable groups. And I think that will come up as one of the conversations in that space. So anonymous attendee who asked that question, please. Yes, join us. That is week three. We'll be discussing mental health among vulnerable groups. So yes, um, I think that's it, uh, Dr. Ari. Uh, for those who yes, joined I think you to watch a video, which was not cooperating, let's see if it will cooperate this time around. <laughs> Otherwise, I think after that, you can everyone can leave. Oh, and the recording will be available. Yes. The recording will be available on YouTube uh, at the end of the week. And that's the Catholic Association. Yes. So people can live at their own pleasure. Meanwhile, uh, we.